we are on a tight timeline. So here we go. Okay. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this special meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order on June 15th, 2023 at 1131 p.m. Um, pursuant to chapters 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by chapters 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Um, Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Um, at this time, um, the meeting is being recorded, and at this time, I'm going to take a roll call attendance of both committee members and the applicants to make sure that everyone can hear and be heard. Um, we're going to start with Pat DeAngelis. Present. Uh, Mandy Jo Haneke is present. Um, Pam Rooney. Here. Uh, Jennifer Taub. Present. And Shalini Balmilm. I'm present. Um, let's go through the applicants. Hilda Greenbaum. Here. Uh, Sarah Marshall. Here. David Slaviter. Here. Philip White. Here. And Everald Henry. Here. Um, okay, so we've got everyone heard and be heard. Um, so uh, right now I'm going to go through what is going to happen today um, in terms of just the logistics of the interviews. We are here for the group interviews um, and then we will see when they end to see what else we will be doing um, <laughs> or, or when we will be taking up the consideration of the recommendations um, and discussion of the recommendations, depending on timing. But how the group interviews work is each of the, um, we do them as a group. We have, we've sent you the interview questions. There's about 10 of them. You'll have three minutes to answer basically each one. Um, we will ask them one question at a time and then all five applicants will answer them and then we will move on to the next question at the end of all of the questions i will give an opportunity for each committee member to ask any follow-up questions they may have each committee member is able to ask one follow-up question to each candidate um and so we will just pick another random order of the candidates to go through and then see where the follow-up questions are for that um, the order of response um, I have done randomly. Each person will get exactly two, because there are 10 questions and five applicants, two responses in each of the orders. So each person will answer each question, either two questions first, second, third, fourth, or fifth. Um, the order flips around so you're not always going behind or in front of the same person. Um, the committee members have that order right now, and each committee member will also ask we'll switch which committee, committee member is asking the questions. We will try to indicate the response order before we ask the question so that you kind of know where you are um, for each question. Are there any questions before we actually get started by anyone? Uh, Pam. Thank you. I. It's not a question, it's a statement, and I just want to express appreciation for everyone interested in participating in this and being willing to spend time uh, helping the town out. These are really important functions and we, I personally really appreciate that people are interested in doing this. So thank you. Thank you for that statement, Pam. You have taken over the doing of that for us committee and I appreciate it. I really do appreciate you doing that. So Hilda is trying to show are you trying to show something? Oh, that was just No, a... I just can't control my paper. No, that's fine. I, I didn't know whether you couldn't hear or couldn't say anything. No, no, so no, no, no. It's just that. my paper. Got it. <laughs> okay. Um, I will have a timer going. Hopefully we won't have to use it. Um, if it goes off, I will try to 
have it near a speaker on my so that you'll hear it go off. Um, and then I will kindly ask you to finish up your and your response. So with that, seeing no other questions, um, we are going to move into the questions. I am going to ask the first question, the order of response. I am very boring with the first one is always alphabetical order, and then it totally gets flipped up from that. So the order will be Hilda, then Everald, then Sarah, then David, then Philip. Um, okay, and this question is, what do you feel you bring to the ZBA that can make it successful? Please include any experience you have appearing before the planning board or ZBA or watching one of their meetings. And we will start with Hilda. Hilda is lying because I've been observing and writing about ZBA uh, at least over the last four years where there's been a crying need for people to help out. I've been hearing for the various 40B applications that are upcoming. I've served on at least five different 40B projects, either for the whole project from the beginning or amendments to approve permits. And these include Olympia Heights, Butternut Meadows, Village Parks, Robbery Fields, Presidential Apartments. Um, and I've been following the land use committees, particularly zoning and planning for more than 40 years, first for the Legal and Voters Observer Corps and for the AmersIndy.org. And as I said, I have served eight years on the board already, participating in many MET panels from the first year on. I know the bylaw very well, as well as the geography of the town for having been an assessor for six years. I can read site plans and I understand architectural drawings. I listen carefully, consider thoughtfully and impartially. And I know how to balance the impact of a decision, or at least I think I try, of all three stakeholders, namely the applicant, the abutters, and the town. And again, I am applying because you told me that you needed people. Thank you so much, Hilda. Everall. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, first of all, my name is Everald Henry. Um, <clears throat> And I'm a local attorney in Amherst. I've lived here since 2016. And um, I, I think my family and I have decided that, um, given that my partner is now a tenured professor at UMass, that this is going to be home. And I wanted an opportunity to um, actually serve the community. And so when I went on the website, um, I saw that there are a um, number of positions available. And I thought, how can I help? So as an attorney, what I do is I review um, a lot of legal language, which I imagine the zoning ordinances um, are not very different from that. Um, I know how to do research. I know how to um, collaborate with people. I, I do that on a daily basis. I've done that with people in um, formal work. Um, I, I have not um, sat in on any zoning board hearings, but um, I've had clients who, um, through meeting with them, have had conversations about um, zonings and ordinances and navigating the system. And I thought this was an opportunity to not only um, be part of um, any kind of solutions, but as well as to learn about what I'm, what we're calling home. So, I think that um, as a researcher, um, I, I, I add value in that sense. Um, as someone who knows laws and how to interpret laws and ordinances, I add value in that aspect as well. And as someone who has um, fostered collaboration with different people and actually can hear the problem, think about the problem, and then render or make a decision in concert with other people, that is something that I would bring. And that is, yeah, that is the value I think I would add. Thank you, Everald. Um, Sarah. Thank you. You can hear me, yes? Yes. All right. Well, I was appointed to the ZBA as an associate member just about a year ago. And for the 
past year, I was the only associate member on the board for about six months, I believe. And I was therefore involved in an, in an unusually large number of hearings for special permits as an associate. These ranged from simple extensions to an appeal of a decision of the building inspector to more complicated applications such as a battery energy storage facility and in addition to a large apartment complex. Thus, even in just one year, I've gained considerable experience with CBA duties, limits, deliberations, and practices. I have prepared well for all these hearings for which I was a panel member, attended the site visits, have regularly raised questions about both smaller details and larger concerns about an application. I do not believe that my lack of formal training in architecture, construction, or planning has hindered my ability to understand the documents, drawings, or regulations. And I think that the full members of the ZBA have appreciated and welcomed my involvement this past year. I also bring the willingness to work and protect the interests of the town within the legal constraints. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. David. Hello, thank you. I think in general, what I bring to the committee is many years of experience in business and a member of organizations, uh, including leading a few of them. I'm currently an associate member of the ZBA, and I've attended um, a number of meetings, although I was only appointed in January, so I have not been a member for that long. I've attended site visits, prepared well for every meeting, and participated when I felt I could contribute. So I bring years of business experience, organizational experience, and even ZBA experience. I have testified before the ZBA and the planning board in the past when issues in Amherst came up that I, in which I had interest. So I have observed the various town committees functioning and have participated when I felt I could make a contribution. Thank you, David. Um, Philip. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip White. Uh, I've spent the majority of my life living in or around the city of Wilmington, North Carolina, which, if you're not familiar with it, is a city of approximately 120,000 residents, um, have sat on numerous uh, boards, committees, and in 2001 made the decision to run for a seat on the Wilmington City Council. I uh, was unsuccessful in that bid, but one thing that motivated me out of that was to pursue a formal education uh, as I had little to none. Uh, I am currently a student at Amherst College. I just finished my first semester and my desire is to be of service. Uh, my majors are generally economics and political science. I bring a wealth of knowledge, a desire to learn, and a passion for municipal governance. Uh, I have watched numerous uh, meetings of the ZBA over the past few months um, tried to familiarize myself with the kind of minute differences in phrasing uh, from some of the things that I'm used to, uh, such as like a special use permit, which may not, which is not the same thing as, you know, just a special permit, uh, that sort of thing. But I'm happy to serve. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Philip. I'm going to pass this off to Shalini. Thank you. And thank you all again for being here and for your thoughtful responses. Uh, the question is, tell us about an experience you've had collaborating with a group, particularly where opinions conflicted or the decision was controversial. And the order would be Sarah, Hilda, Philip, Everald, and David. So we'll start with Sarah. Well, during my time so far on ZBA, there have been very few significant conflicts. Um, members have clearly had different opinions at times, but these have been resolved in collegial fashion and decisions have been almost always unanimous. Um, but in contrast, when I was a member of the Community Preservation Act Committee, no 
request triggered as much disagreement among committee members as an application from the Friends of the Jones Library for a million dollars three and a half years ago. Of course, public comments were also strong on both sides. And despite extensive discussion of the committee, there was no meeting of the minds. Members disagreed, but everyone was civil and discussed the pros and cons in detail. In detail. That particular request from the library was first approved and then withdrawn. And the library submitted a new proposal in the following year's grant round, which was approved. And we still received numerous comments from the public in writing and at the hearing, both supporting and objecting to the project. But as committee members, we kept our focus on the grant application and the purpose and the requirements of the CPA program and set aside comments that asked us to go beyond our authority or raised matters that were not for the committee to decide. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Tilda, you're next. Are you waiting for me? What? Yes, Hilda, it's yours. Did you have, do you I, have the question? I, I couldn't hear you. Um, yes. Okay, I have served as panelist or chair for many single to two family problematic conversions, particularly in the Lincoln Sunset neighborhood where the room was packed with the butters. In one case, what appeared to be a single family home being rented out to seven tenants because there were seven locks on seven doors. Um, and, and that sort of signifies to many of us, according to the law, it's uh, uh, being rented room by room, which really isn't a, a, a rental leasehold under many laws and bylaws. In any event, these abutters um, were, were not pleasant neighbors in many ways. They had loud parties, especially on the weekends, the usual behavior that I'm not gonna repeat here, the neighbors know what I'm talking about was happening. And there were many, many complaints about the noise and the parties and the litter and that the house wasn't being well maintained, et cetera. Um, I was willing to go along with allowing two three bedroom units and limiting the number of tenants in the building to six where they currently had six that seven that we knew about trying to accommodate more than 50 abutters in that room i would go along with two three bedroom units and ran into Flack with the chair of the committee who said, Hilda, that's going to fail. And then you're going to end up with nobody, no permit at all and no conditions on the permit. And I, got, I had a cave to allow the two four bedroom units or there would have been no, nobody was willing to compromise in that particular situation. Another, another place I can come up with is there were three of us women on a permit for Village Park, which was a 40B permit given back in the 60s, early 70s, I guess. Um, their siding on the building was seriously deteriorated. They had hired a contractor from South Hadley to reside all of the buildings of Village Park. And he had already bought the material and paid for it. So applied for the building permit in order to replace it. And the then building inspector says, no, you have to have a permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals because of the condition on your permit that changes to the exterior of the building had to be uh, come back to the board for their approval. Well, two of us thought it was a no brainer. And the third woman on the board who no longer lives in town so I can talk about it. Um, she refused to go along with changing the color from dark brown to, to light tan. And meanwhile, here's the guy sitting on several hundred dollars worth of siding that is, well, we were able to reach a compromise after a long discussion and the buildings were sided with, brown, with the light tan, but had some 
dark brown trim that they hadn't planned on. So anyway, that that worked out. Otherwise, please finish up. We can, otherwise, what what seems to be working very well right now on the several controversial permits that I have watched over the past year is if you can get the abutter and the appellant to sit in the same room together, try to work out their issues and bring a condition back to the board. The board has usually agreed with that and it's worked out very well. Thank you, Hilda. Um, and Philip, you're next. So I have to be honest with everyone. When I read this question, I actually burst out loud. Uh, so without being partisan whatsoever, I will simply state that uh, Having spent the majority of my life in North Carolina and operating as a liberal, I would say roughly 95% of everything I've tried to do has been met with deep opposition, um, hence the laughter. Uh, but no, I would say a perfect example of transitions that we tried to make in our community that were met with stiff opposition would be during my time uh, serving on the new Hanover County Board of Directors for the Parks. We tried to make the transition from what are known as actively styled parks to more passive styled parks. And I'm happy to go as deep into detail with any of these things as you'd like. Um, but very briefly, uh, in the past for several hundred years, most public parks have been designed uh, as an active style, meaning they glow in, clear cut everything, destroy all the indigenous plants, wildlife. And in the South, they would lay down Bermuda grass or fescue uh, park looks just the same in Wilmington, North Carolina as it would in Amherst, Massachusetts. What we've come to realize is that's completely detrimental to our environment, to the experience and to the act of play, which is what you want your residents to utilize parks for. You would think that wouldn't really get much pushback, um, but there was a immense amount, still don't even remember why they were upset. Uh, we also <clears throat> were able to work on going from what you might more traditionally think of as a park, which is just a large open area, to what are called pocket parks, which are small parks in neighborhoods. Uh, that increases play, it increases access to people that may not have direct access to a vehicle. It opens up the park system to residents instead of essentially expecting you know, residents to find a park and drive across town. We've seen a lot of great success with that. <clears throat> and they will actually be opening a park, hopefully in the next six to eight months, the timeline is a little, um, which is gonna be our first large, massive passive design project. Um, the only things that we clear cut when we went in there were the areas for the children's play, uh, the dog park, everything else, we maintain the nat natural vegetation. Uh, because I think it's important to let people experience the outside as opposed to experiencing sort of a cultured and manicured copy of any park anywhere else in the nation. Thank you, Philip. Uh, next is Everett. Experiences collaborating with a group. Um, so currently I serve on the board of a local school and in, in, in that role we control um, the board controls the, the fiscal budget, the, the decision of how many kids to admit each year and, and how to pay the bills and things of that nature. And of course, sitting on a five person board, there is um, the, the ultimate goal is, of course, for the school, but there, there is complete interest as to what each person thinks um, is the appropriate step to do. So in, in, in that arena, we have um, different, um, you know, opinions that the conflict. So the biggest one that um, I would say where the decision was controversial um, was extending classroom sizes. And that comes with, you know, budgetary questions, budgetary concerns, and making sure that you're still within the guidelines of being, um, a nonprofit institution and things, you know, as well as um, adding staff and paying staff. And so there was a conversation where there were proponents who wanted to extend the class sizes. And of course, 
Um, my position was, of course, in the opposite because, again, trying to make sure that we are within fiscal responsibility as well as making sure that our reserves are not overextended. And rather than extending class sizes and having to find FTEs to teach classes, why not um, do something with current staff? Maybe we're in an inflation period, give some raises and things of that nature. And so we had those difficult conversations. And with that, I was able to convince um, my other board members to say, this is um, a more seasoned and probably a better path to go that doesn't have too many unknowns attached to it. And with that, I was able to convince the board that my position was um, what will be most appropriate for the school at the time. Thank you, Everald. And David, you're up next. I could give you specific examples, but I won't because I really don't want to relive the traumas of being a synagogue president and the president of a condo homeowner association. So instead, I'll just tell you that I was the president of a synagogue in Philadelphia for three years. And as the president of an 18 member board, that means that if everyone was in attendance, there were at least 25 different opinions in the room. And everyone's a volunteer and everyone feels that everything they have to say is brilliant and vital and must be adopted. So dealing with those kinds of controversies that come up gave me a lot of experience in finding consensus. And since it was a one-year term, I kept getting reelected because I build consensus and deal respectfully with people. The condominium board, I was actually president for 20 years. I kept getting reelected for the same reason. I build consensus, but the difference is that in a condominium board, everyone has a financial involvement and everybody it has their own agenda. They want to spend less money or more money, or they want to improve something, or they don't want to improve something. And it was necessary to work in those circumstances to find the best way forward while still maintaining the integrity of the condominium and the organization. So it's those two extended experiences that uh, that is where I got most of my experience dealing with differing opinions. Thanks. Thank you, David. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, and um, thank you. These I'm riveted with um, your responses. This is, so um, the order. Um, for that will request responses to my question is uh, first Philip, then David, then Everald, um, Hilda, and Sarah. And the question is brief. Um, please explain the difference, if you can, between the role of the ZBA and the role of the planning board. Not that the response is brief, but the question is short. <laughs> so again, the difference between the role of the ZBA and the planning board, and we'll start with Philip. Uh, well, actually, I mean, I'll try to make my answer fairly brief uh, without going into, you know, the definite, you know, responses, things like, you know, the planning committee, the majority of things require simple majority to pass, special permits take, what is it, three, two thirds, I believe. Um, without going into all that, I would just broadly describe the difference as the planning are looking at exactly that, uh, planning for the future of Amherst, uh, making sure that people have their interest represented and setting the rules. Uh, the ZBA is their role primarily, and once again, painting with a broad brush, is going to be in any situation where you have firm rules in order for any organization uh, or organism to thrive, there are gonna be exceptions to those rules. And that in itself I see as the role of the ZBA. Thank you, Philip. Um, and next to David. To me, the fundamental difference between the two is that the ZBA is a quasi-judicial board. It is there to interpret and apply set rules that have already been determined 
and there is a limit to what we can create or change because we have to operate within rules that are set. So the planning board has their own function of creating situations and the ZBA uh, has to apply the rules as they exist to the applications at, for exceptions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Everald. So the planning board, um, you know, provides for and guides the growth of um, the community. I, I, I would say they set the terms, so to speak, and then the ZBA um, is meant to um, regulate the use, the placement of structures and other such requirements um, that the planning board has implemented. So yes, I do, um, I would say the ZBA is a um, quasi-judicial body that interprets what the language of um, the zoning ordinances are. And of course, the planning board would have some input into what goes into those ordinances. Okay, thank you. Um, Hilda. Oh, I think you're muted. You're muted, Hilda. I, I agree with, with most of what's already been said, but maybe a little nuanced answer. Traditionally, the planning board wrote the bylaw, which was enforced by the Zoning Board of Appeals. But gradually over the years, the state has streamlined the hearing process to allow planning boards to grant special permits where required in projects allowed by right. It was felt at town meeting many times that that's to say 40 years ago that the chairman of the zoning board did not comment on zoning amendments at town meeting because she felt that was a conflict of interest. The principal difference between special permits that are granted by the zoning board of appeals is that they are discretionary. They're not allowed by right and any particular project must comply with all the provisions of the bylaw, as well as positive findings found on the 10.6, uh, 10.38, which is essentially determines that particular project is, is uh, would be an asset to a particular neighborhood rather than have detrimental effects in terms of air pollution, groundwater pollution, uh, noisy tenants, which can be handled by things like conditions on a special permit. And it can be turned down if it's determined that it's not a good use for a particular neighborhood. The other difference with the, with the zoning board special permit is it is appealable to the housing court or superior court um, if it, uh, uh, a butter finds there is going to be serious damages to his property from a project he has standing to appeal. Anybody within 300 feet of a project has, can appeal, but they may not be judged to have standing by the court if the court doesn't feel that their damages are, are worthy of a trial. Um, I guess that's particularly the big, this could be a 15 minute hour lecture and I'll try to keep it short, but special permits are appealable. They are not allowed by right. They must keep the town, the abutters and the applicant all on the same wavelength. Thank you, or in agreement or semi-agreement. Thank you, Hilda. Uh, Sarah. Thank you. The spheres of action for the planning board and the zoning board of appeals are specified in the zoning bylaw, the ZBA regulations, and our charter. And they are non overlapping, which is important to me because my husband serves on the planning board. Importantly, neither body interferes with or oversees the business of the other. And the ZBA has been mentioned as has been mentioned handles four types of actions. Um, it hears appeals from property owners who are unhappy with either actions of the building commissioner 
or who appeal certain provisions of the zoning bylaw. And the other two types of work for the ZBA are to develop and grant special permits and comprehensive permits for affordable housing projects. In contrast, the planning board, but not the ZBA, conducts site plan reviews. And why certain special permits are assigned to the ZBA as opposed to the planning board, I do not know. And I know that some shifting of duties is under discussion um, and would require a vote of council. Another area of activity um, for the planning board uh, and less so for the ZBA is to suggest or develop new bylaws. Um, ZBA may be asked for input, but it does not seem to be a primary responsibility for that, that board. Thank you. Okay. Uh Thank you, Sarah. And um, Pat, I think you're asking the next question. Thank you. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for coming forward. Um, I'm going to build a little bit on the last question, basically. And uh, the order will be Everald, Hilda, David, Philip, and then Sarah. Uh, yes. And when interpreting a provision of the zoning bylaw, should the ZBA consider the intent of that provision? It's common sense meaning or some other factor. And um, Everald? I, I think um, the intent and the common sense meaning. And I, I, I say that because as an attorney, I think that um, the, we live in a place of gray versus black and white um, because there are times when um, the provision is there, but in its common sense implication, you may try to look at it and see, okay, something's askew. And how do you make sure that you are doing what is um, within the provision, but at the same time, applying real world implications, mm -hmm. um, common sense to it. So I don't think we can just um, look at it and say, okay, the provision is this and that is that. Um, I think we want to make sure that it's been interpreted that it's it, in a way that um, fosters the intent um, of the town um, or fosters um, not just the intent, but growth as well. And at the same time, not encroaching on whomever is before the ZBA trying to um, make sense of this provision. So if there is ever an avenue where you can see a provision, but in its common sense application, it doesn't really make sense or it doesn't foster the intent of the town. And I, I, th I think there's an opportunity here to say, OK, this is a provision. This is a common sense implication. What can we do to make sure that um, whatever decision is made is being is going towards something that benefits um, not necessarily just the town itself, but perhaps the people who are appealing said provision. So I try to look for um, what the actual language says, and then in interpreting that language, look at common sense implications as well by interpreting the language. Thank you, thank you. Hilda? I, I would just like to begin by making an addendum to Sarah's answer to the last question. And it used to be that the zoning board did make recommendations to the planning board for changes that we found in the bylaw where there were inconsistencies and difficulties of interpretation. And, and so my answer to question three is it depends <laughs> and the, the everything, it depends. There's no black and white answer in anything. But the first one I will give is an example of a appeal of a decision made by a former building inspector. A sorority on Nutting Avenue owned two buildings, one in which they occupied, the other one that they rented out. And they happened to rent it out to a fraternity that was I, I was the chair of that one, went to the site visit alone and then the house was immaculate, really nice kids. They were a service fraternity that built ramps for handicapped people in town and planted 
many of the daffodil bulbs that we see come up in the springtime. Well, anyway, the building inspector said that use wasn't allowed, that it was a, a sorority building, that there's a difference between fraternity and sorority buildings. In one place in the bylaw, it says fraternity or sorority, and in another place in the use table of the bylaw with that section three, Another place it says sorority and fraternity. And, and this building inspector said there was a difference. Well, after listening to what everybody had to say, we went along with the building inspector and, and said that this was a different use and fraternities aren't allowed in a building that's a sorority. I felt that that was discrimination, but in any event, I went along and, and, and we approved it, but they, the fraternity went to court, they won and subsequently bought the building. So that's one, one answer to the question. And the, um, the other thing is that the bylaw has, the same bylaw has been interpreted very differently over the past 40 years. I can say, at the time in the 80s, when town was growing very fast, Amity Place, Salem Place were all coming before the board. Developers knew they were gonna get caught. So they came in with many more units and they got cut in half. And that was to balance the, the, the opinions of what's best for the town, what's best for the butters, what's everybody cut, cut, and developers knew that and compensated for that and coming in with more than they wanted. And, and one example of that is Mill Valley Estates came in as a 40B that, that's down on, on in South Amherst. Mill Valley Estates came in asking for 200 units under a 40B where provisions of the bylaw can be waived. Please finish and, up, Hilda. Okay, oh, so they got cut from 208 to 180 by the zoning board, went to housing court and ended up with 134 that they have today. Where Mill site, they crammed, that was on 34 acres and the Mill site North Amherst has 130 units, just as many on five acres. So that's why I say the answer depends on how you enter. It's what the needs are at the time. Thank you. Okay, let's move to David. Um, okay, well, of uh, the way the question is phrased of uh, common sense or intent, I think both of those and any other reasonable question should all be considered. We are not unthinking robots, nor does anyone know everything. We bring experience and knowledge that informs our views of issues. We should not leave out common sense or a healthy skepticism when considering a proposal before the board. That said, our primary mandate is to follow and interpret set rules. If we're asked to consider exceptions to rules, we must use a lot of common sense and consider everything that is presented and then in the end, make a properly qualified and considered decision. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Philip? Uh, first of all, I apologize for bringing my secret weapon. I don't know if you saw, but my dog decided she wanted to be on the call for a second. <laughs> oh, no, uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, but no, as, with regards to this question, like everyone who's replied so far, I would agree that we're dealing with situations of gray air. Um, however, I believe the primary thing that we should be looking at is the intent. Um, however, another thing, as was the third part of this question, that has been absolutely marvelous for me with watching all of these uh, previous ZBA meetings is seeing the precedent that's been established by previous uh, members, and I don't necessarily mean legal precedent. Uh, what I mean by that statement is seeing things that I've been discussing for years uh, and talking about the importance of them, things like dark sky lighting on the importance of indigenous pollinating you know, plants uh, be discussed at pretty much every meeting. Uh, that is a precedent that I am ha would be happy to uphold in, in, in every opportunity. <laughs> Uh, every time that I hear it mentioned, it tickles my little heart a little bit, but yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah. Well, the question suggests that intent may conflict with common sense meaning. Um, and I don't know from experience of any such case. So I've tried to imagine example an example. Um, maybe there is a provision in the bylaw about where or how vehicles can be stored, which assumed that the vehicles would use gasoline or diesel fuels. But perhaps a property owner in 2023 will only have electric vehicles, which were not even envisioned when the bylaw was written. Common sense might tell us that the provision is not needed in such case. But whether legally the ZBA has the authority to waive or modify that provision is a different matter. Um, and the board might need to consult with the town attorneys. A uh, conflict like that could prompt changes to the regulations to reflect um, cha more changes in, our, in the way we live. But in any case, how could the ZBA know the intent of a provision if that is not spelled out in the bylaw? It, it seems to me it would be mind reading unless there is a, a record of the discussions that led to the, to the bylaw. But in any case, members are always going to need to use their judgment. So in addition to the common sense versus, versus the literal reading, there is always judgment because language is imper imperfect, incomplete, and we need to uh, judge as a board what is significant perhaps, or what is consistent in that case. Um, Past decisions don't settle those questions once and for all time, but can be helpful in illuminating the thinking of the board. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. I'll pass it to Pam. Thank you. Uh, the order for this question will be Sarah first, then David, Hilda, Philip, and Everald. So the question is, in considering those with an interest in a special permit, should the interest of one party be given greater significance than another party? We'll start with Sarah. Okay. Collaboration between applicants and abutters or others in the neighborhood is a good thing and can resolve objections or matters of concern before the ZBA even opens a hearing. But I expect that sometimes an abutter's concerns are not resolved, but are not reasonable. And I would not want the abutter to effectively have veto power over someone else's property. Right. Because in this country, our, in, in the end, our country recognizes and enforces strong property rights. The zoning bylaw and regulations define the extent of the public's control over private property, and those limits must not be exceeded lest the ZBA on the taxpayer's dime face legal challenge. If it seems impossible to satisfy all parties' desires, but an application can be reasonably said to meet the legal requirements, then I think I would weigh the interests of the property owner most highly in such a case. Thank you. That goes to David, please. In, in this case, I think that actually no party has an inherently greater significance than any other party, except perhaps abutters whose immediate concerns should be, should be taken into consideration. They are the ones who maybe will be most affected but the interests of the town in general, the greater good also deserve uh, full consideration. I don't think that the applicant has an inherent enhanced right just because they are applying, especially if it's in the case of a developer. So I, I don't think that any specific party has a greater significance than any other party and that the, uh, the applicant for a special permit needs to make a compelling case for it to be approved. Thanks. Thank you. 
we go to Hilda, please. I interpreted this question a little differently. And my answer is never exclamation, exclamation. The board members must be impartial and no matter the needs of the town, board members must act in an unbiased manner. Listen carefully and judge with your best judgment from the facts, not from emotions. Thank you. Philip. Um, I would agree with the response from Hilda. Uh, I do believe that it's very important for any governmental entity to um, work as impartial as is possible. Um, when you're looking at the rights of abutting property owners, of the interests of the town, of property owners, sometimes they can conflict. Um, I think in that situation, and as I've said from watching so many of these meetings, uh, the one that I watched the other day, it was actually, I think, the most recent meeting. Uh, one thing that I saw, which is, I think, an excellent example of compromise between the ZBA and a property owner looking for a special permit. Um, this was the property on, I believe it's Pine Street. Uh, when they were discussing parking for it, the ZBA and the property owner were able to work at planting trees uh, in front of the designated parking area so that the headlights wouldn't possibly shine into the abutting or the neighbor's property. Uh, that sort of compromise, I think, is going to be essential so that as many parties as possible, hopefully all, feel that they're having their interests represented. Great, thank you very much. Thank and you. Everyone You're muted, Everald. I'm sorry. Um, while I agree that the board has to be neutral, um, my answer is it depends. Um, if if it is, um, in, in reading the question, if one party is a resident and the other party is the town, then my response is um, we should apply the least restrictive means um, to achieve a compelling government interest. So essentially, if the other party is the town and, you know, what we should do, I, 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 it is the position that I've always had that um, we shouldn't be as restrictive with um, members of the, of the community to achieve a compelling, you know, town interest. If it's, um, neighbor to neighbor, then I do not believe that we should give um, greater significance from one person to the next um, based on their issue. Um, we're talking about people that are appropriately assessed taxes and, um, and, and, and that's what gives them equal voice here. So to say that your interest is, a, you know, is greater than that of your neighbor, um, I, that, that is not the position that I would take. Um, the other point I would like to make is um, I, I like the greater good um, position where if the other part, you know, is what is this, what is the significance of this request? How does it um, benefit um, the community as a whole is that being considered, and so in 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 that scenario, um, I would apply arguably a different standard. And so again, my answer is it depends. Thank you, thank you all. I'm going to pass this now to Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, um, my question: the order of response would be uh, David. Uh, then Philip, then Everald, um, Sarah, and Hilda. And the question is, what's your opinion of waivers, exceptions, dimensional special permits in the zoning bylaw? So your opinion of in the zoning bylaw, waivers, except, exceptions, and dimensional special permits within the zoning bylaw, when should they be used and when should they probably not be used? And we'll start with David. 
I think all of these are useful tools to address legitimate, special, and unforeseen circumstances. I think they should be applied fairly and impartially. I don't think that the granting of waivers should at all be automatic or expected. They need to be fully, the requests need to be substantiated and, um, and justified. I, I would be guided in almost all of these, or all of these, I can't think of an exception, with a compelling public interest. If the if the public interest if the public has no interest in whether a garden shed is eight feet from the property line versus ten feet from the property line, then it doesn't matter so much. But I think the the well being and the future of the town of Amherst is the most compel, compelling criteria to be applied in these, and that these legitimate tools should be applied with that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, next is Philip. Uh, so once again, uh, I'm going to agree with the statement uh, that the previous uh, speaker uh, said. Uh, I do believe uh, in examples that they should be used. Uh, giving the example of dimensional special permits, uh, if you're looking to increase affordable housing, looking at things like increasing in zoning densities um, is a viable way to utilize that tool. However, on the flip side of that, I would never want to utilize something like that if, as David was saying, we feel that the interests of the people are not being served by you know, increasing zoning density or whatever uh, the situation before us may be. Uh, I believe that they're all valuable tools to have in our tool belt. However, you wouldn't use a hammer to put in a screw. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Everald. I, I think it goes back to um, part of my previous answer. So it's, um, if the waivers, the exceptions are clearly spelled out, in the bylaws to say, for this situation, there is a waiver, or um, it tells you what the waiver is, then we should apply that standard because it is already defined and we know what it is. Um, if it is something that is um, out of the norm and it is not defined, then my position would be that um, these are necessary to address the issues as they emerge. And um, if, how do they foster um, the growth of the community as a whole? How do they benefit the community as a whole? And understanding that um, the positions or decisions you make may not be acceptable to everyone, but if the decision on the waiver and the exceptions and the special permits are being made, um, not just for individuals, but to advance the growth or, or you know, fix something that we, the, the town thinks needs fixing, then I would support that as well. So it's, um, if it's clearly defined in the bylaws, then we act with that understanding. If it is something that requires consideration then the position would be, how does it advance the community as a whole and how does it benefit um, the town as a whole? And based on those arguments presented and made, decision will be made with that. Thank you. Um, Sarah, please, thanks. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is sensible for a zoning bylaw to allow for waivers and exceptions and to require special permits because the bylaw cannot foresee or efficiently spell out every possible real world zoning, land use, or construction issue, or how to resolve each one. But it is also smart for the, Z excuse me, the zoning bylaw to be quite specific about when an owner can apply for a waiver or exception, what can be waived, 
and to be specific about the limits of the ZBA's power to grant those exceptions. And where the bylaw does not spell out decision criteria for the board, the decision still must enhance public welfare and excuse me, public health and welfare and cannot conflict with the general goals of the bylaw. The ZBA should require and uh, that there a clear demonstration that the owner would be significantly burdened without the exception being granted an exception or a waiver. Um, and in such a case, the concerns of abutters in the public would be um, uh, e even more important, perhaps, since, uh, since a, a, a bylaw is being perhaps waived. Thank you. And uh, Hilda, you're... Again, we got a situation of it depends. It depends on the facts of the case. One must be a little bit careful here about where a waiver or exception or a dimensional variation would be really asking for a variance from the bylaw and variances can only be granted by a zoning board of appeals in the case of serious hard hardship like there's a rock in the middle of the property and you have to build on the setback because that's the only place and and a court would would find that the variance is appropriate but for the most part they're very very hard to determine and and the the definitions of the law of when a variance can be granted is specified and um Chapter 40B applications in order to allow more, more affordable housing units to be built allows all sections of the bylaw to be waived. Um, our bylaw, it allows exceptions on waivers from the parking bylaw. For example, if a business, and I say on the corner of High Street and Main Street, there are little businesses there in a very small parking lot. Parking can be waived there because the business, the, the, the conditions under the bylaw would, would allow where it's a walkable business, it's on a bus route, it's not going to be a detriment to the neighborhood. That, that would allow, under 10.38, the findings can be found to allow waivers or exceptions to the bylaw there. And in any case, any decision that's made has to have findings that are positive under 10.38, that it is compatible and not a detriment to the neighborhood. Thank you. And thank you all for those really thoughtful responses. Um, and Pat, so I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, you're still sorry about that. <laughs> um, we're going to go in the following order. Hilda will be responding first, then Everald, Sarah, David, and Philip. And the question is, what is your approach to incorporating public input into your decision making? And Hilda? First of all, I would listen very carefully to both sides. Secondly, when, especially when I'm chair, I let everyone in the room speak, especially when you have a huge neighborhood outpouring to a bad landlord in a neighborhood who wants to make a bad situation worse. So you listen to everybody, go row by row, let everybody talk who wants to talk, of course, with the, with the proviso, please not to repeat what's already been said, but try to give us new information and allow everybody to know that you're listening, both sides. Allow the applicant to rebut, and then you determine from everything that you've heard whether the problems that the butters are telling you about, about a particular landlord, whether they can be fixed with enforceable conditions or whether it's a case where you want to deny the permit. That's how I listen. Thank you. Everald? The board will be serving the public, so it's absolutely important that the public has a voice. Um, whether it is a neighbor coming before the board, you know, trying to get something done, 
in their neighborhood, um, whatever you do sets a precedent and therefore um, somebody else might say, but well, you did this for this such and such, you know, therefore you have to have the public way in. Now, anyone knows that with the public weighing in, you are going to have competing interests and many, many different competing interests. And so the important thing is making sure that everyone um, feels heard, has their, you know, has a voice. But at the same time, um, my approach is to never like make any promises um, to anyone because again, you still have guidelines that you have to abide by and follow through. Um, when it comes to um, public input um, in decision making, the main focus is openness, transparency, and making sure people understand that while we are listening to your concerns, which are valid concerns, um, the decision that we make at times may not be the proper decision, but regardless whether it is a popular decision or not, you have to understand that your voice was heard, your position was considered, and in the end, the decision was made that we thought was most appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Sarah? Thanks. I hope that I have an open mind and am willing to take to heart the concerns and arguments made by the public. In my experience on ZBA, the board does respond to comments, even if dialogue is not permitted. In the case of specific applications in which I've been involved, public comments have been useful in adding information and perspectives about the pros and cons of the applicant's proposal and have suggested new issues to discuss with the applicants. In fact, these comments from the public can and do result in conditions attached to a permit. Thank you, Sarah. David? Well, the short answer is that generally speaking, all input should be considered. If it is fair and appropriate, we should listen and incorporate it in our decision. If it is foolish or self-serving, we can view it as such. There are various ways to submit input from the public, letters, petitions, public participation at hearings, and all of these are appropriate ways to give input and, and we should consider all of it so that everyone knows that they were heard and that the resulting decision uh, included any every idea that anybody had. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, David. Philip? Um, I believe that public input, constructive criticism are, well, for lack of a better way of putting it, a gift. Um, all of us, I believe, having served on boards before can tell you, uh, as everyone here knows, that sometimes that gift can feel a little bit like giving someone a set of tires that doesn't have a car, but <laughs> it's still a gift. No, uh, <laughs> I believe that engaging the public, uh, getting the public involved is of the utmost importance. I also believe that you should live your beliefs. An example of me doing that is Whenever I am in an open meeting, I try my best to not use abbreviations. Uh, the logic behind that is if we're trying to engage the public and get the public more involved in their own communities, we're dealing with a lot of niche terminology. And I believe that by using a lot of abbreviations, we lose the majority of the population. Um, in a way, it disenfranchises them from their own communities because they grow tired and they just simply have no idea what's going on, so they stop showing up. Um, I think that is a disservice to the community. Thank you. And I will pass it on to Pam. Thank you. Um, this is a little more general, and it's, uh, um, it's going to start with Philip, then Sarah, then David, Hilda, and Everald. And the question is, is there anything else you would like to share with us that makes you a strong candidate for the ZBA? Anything you may have forgotten in the first in the first round? 
uh, I will absolutely go first on a short question. No, <laughs> no. As I said before, uh, my passion for service. Um, I was writing economic development plans, um, working on land development codes with only a high school diploma. And at 41, as I said, have made the decision to go back to pursue a formal education. I am a lifelong learner. I am the sort of person who, if I do not know the answer right off the top of my head, my response is always going to be, I apologize. Um, I don't have the finite answer for that, but can I email it to you? Because I believe that that's how people in public service should operate. Um, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to speak to you and hope to see you all in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, we go to Sarah. Thanks. Well, I've enjoyed my year uh, so far on the ZBA. I've found the work interesting and I hope to deepen my understanding of the bylaw and the master plan and how these play out for the benefit of our community. Uh, I would add that my professional training and work as a scientist, teacher, and consultant always centered attention to detail, objectivity, questioning, and weighing of the evidence, and of careful listening. And these habits of mine have been useful to me in a ro role where so much critical review and thoroughness are needed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we go to David, please. I moved to Amherst about 15 years ago by choice because I liked the idea of living here. I liked what the town offered. And I believe in participating. I believe in public service. I, I bring a lot of experience in different disciplines, real estate, business, uh, nonprofits, and as an associate member of the ZBA, now. So I've seen the ZBA, how it works, and it's a it's an appropriate uh, arm of town government for me to participate in with my background. There are other areas that are of interest to me for which I believe I'm not qualified. In this case, I believe I am well qualified, and that's why I'm applying for this position. Thank you. Thank you, David. We go to Hilda, please. Hilda has the wisdom of age. I've been, <laughs> I've been a resident of this valley since 1954. I've watched us grow from a very small college, very quaint college town to what we are now, a big city that ain't so quaint no more. Um, I'm trained as a scholar. I I'm, I'm think logically, I, I think I can write reasonably well. I've had a lot of practice writing and editing. I have a, a learning curve that's minimal. I will only have to catch up with all of the new changes of the bylaw that came in February of, I think, 2021 of the new zoning bylaw, which is to try to accommodate more housing in towns that don't want it, particularly in the metropolitan Boston area. And otherwise, I think I've demonstrated over these many years that I got the skills to do the job and the time and the ability. Thank you, Hilda. And we go finally to Everum. I think you're muted. As a, as a person, I, I care. Um, I, I care about people. I, I like people. I think that I, I have been um, fortunate throughout my life. And so service is important to me. Um, I, I have done, um, even in high school and college, a lot of volunteer work, and that has never left me. I continue to do so even now. Um, a big part of what I do is I take cases for people who cannot afford attorneys. And one of the things that I see is people who feel that they don't have a voice in the place that they call home and the place that they live. So um, doing this um, allows me to um, be more of service and help um, my community as a whole. 
Um, I like the law. Um, the zoning appeal board does a lot with regulations. Um, I know how to read and interpret laws. Um, I I write, I, I think I write well. Um, and with all that said, I'm also not afraid to say I don't know. Um, because there is a lot of things that I don't know and won't know, but what but that's only a temporary situation. Um I always come prepared. Um, I always make sure that um, whatever I don't know, I will say, I don't know right now versus I don't know. And the next time you see me, I promise that I will have um, a better response for you. Maybe not the answer that you want, but I'll be able to better answer your concerns and your question. And that's why I think that I'm suited for this board. Great, thank you so much. We go to uh, Shalini, please. Yes, so almost there, hang in. <laughs> so uh, the order would be Everald, Philip, Hilda, Sarah, and David. And the question is, please confirm you have the time to commit to meetings, hearings, and site visits. And if you currently serve on any town boards or committees, do you see any conflicts with serving on multiple boards? And can you manage the time commitment for all? So starting with you, Everald. So I do have time um, to commit to meetings, hearings, and site visits. Um, I do not currently serve on any town boards, but full disclosure, I have applied to be in um, a few additional boards because as I said, um, I am interested in this place we, um, we call home. Um, and there may be times, do I see any conflicts with serving on multiple boards? I don't, the ones that I've applied for, I don't think so. Um, I do not believe that there are any conflicts, but if there are conflicts, um, I do know how to get out of, you know, get out of conflict. So I do not imagine that being an issue, but I, I am available. Um, I, I wouldn't have applied if I didn't think I could be um, of service. Thank you. Uh, next is Philip. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I am not on any other boards or committees. Um, and so I would see, obviously, no conflict of interest there. However, I would say that in the future, if I were to be appointed to additional boards, then I think it's simple. If you see that there's any sort of conflict of interest, I always kind of opt on the side when it comes to politics and public service. If you have to question if there's a conflict of interest, there probably is. So mm -hmm. I would err on the side of recusing myself or removing myself from whatever the issue may be. Thank and I do you. have the time. Like I said, I am yeah. currently right now a full-time student at Amherst College. I'm not working. Uh, thankfully, we're in a financial position where that's possible. So literally, it would be this board and still at school. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Philip. And Hilda. Um, I am ready and available if you need my help. Mm -hmm. um, the only conflict would be the coverage of the ZBA meetings for the AmherstIndy.org. I could refrain from doing so on panels I am not serving if you feel that it is still a conflict. I will not report on, uh, the, on panels on which I am serving. I will find somebody to cover it, but you can decide whether I would watch the meetings anyway if I'm not appointed and you'll hear all about it in the AmherstIndy.org, another plug. <laughs> Thank you, Hilda. Uh, Sarah? Yes, I have the time and I don't serve on any other town boards or committees. Great. And David? Yes, I have the time and the flexibility and I don't serve on any other boards and don't foresee applying to any other boards. So I, I have the time. Yes. Thank you very much. Mandy, last question. I think this one, I don't know whether it will be the easiest one you faced or not today. It, it's um, where we have, as as we have said, there are openings for three year, what we call full members. They're a full three year term um, and they are the default panelists on any application. Um, we have openings for an associate member, which is a one year term. 
um, and they are sort of the members who, if a full member, if another member cannot make a panel, the associate members um, step up and serve on that panel until that panel is done. So that could be multiple meetings or not. And so our question is, are you interested in being the full, uh, 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 considered for a full membership, the three-year term, associate membership, one-year term, or either? Um, and we will start with David. I am applying to be a full member, and I am currently an associate member. And if I am not chosen to be a full member, I would be willing to continue as an associate member. Thank, Thank you. you. Sarah. I would like to serve as a full member and believe I climbed the learning curve pretty quickly in this past year and that I'm ready to move into that role. But I would be happy to serve again as an associate if that's what you need. Thank you, Sarah. Philip. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, my desire is to serve as a full member. Um, however, I would definitely be open to being an associate member if that's what the committee feels would be the best fit. As I said, my desire is simply to be of service however I can. Thank you, Philip. Everald. I am applying to be a full member, but um, I'm also open to serving as an associate member as well. Thank you. Uh, and Hilda. It all. Um, I'll leave it up to your discretion to do what you feel is most appropriate to cover your need, the needs of the zoning board in terms of particularly the 40B applications, which I know are problematic. Thank, thank you, Hilda. Um, with that, we have made it through the interviews. Um, what will happen next is we're almost at one. Um, oh. We have follow up questions. I almost forgot. Um, so we have to go through the follow up questions. I apologize for that. So we're not quite complete with the interviews yet. Um, I'm going to go just for ease of everything in alphabetical order because that's the first response order I've got on my list here. Um, and so are there any follow up questions for Hilda from committee members? Uh, please raise your hand either visually or not if you have any follow up questions um, or through the raise hand button or visually. I'll catch both. I am not seeing any hands for Hilda. For Everald, does anyone have any follow-up questions for Everald? I am not seeing any. Uh, any for Sarah? You guys did a really good job, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing any hands for follow-up questions for Sarah. Any hands for follow-up questions for David? And any follow-up questions for Philip? See no hands. I must say, you guys all and oh wait, one Pat snuck in there. Pat, oh, you're muted. Pat, it's not a question, Philip. I just want you to know that I also went to college in my 40s and uh, graduated from Smith at 50 and uh, got my master's at 51. So right on, <laughs> good job. <laughs> So I want to thank everyone for taking the time out to come to, to submit your statements of interest, to come here and answer all of the questions. This was, I think, the longest set of questions we've had for ZBA interviews since I've been doing these on the council um, and, and everything. So what's going to happen now is um, we're going to, once I've confirmed that the applicants don't have any questions for us in terms of process after I explain everything. We're going to move all of the applicants into the attendee section um, as we move into discussions of applications. Um, we will discuss the interviews, the all, all of the applicants, the interviews, the statements of interest, everything, uh, look at our selection guidance, and then um, if we have time today, get to potentially voting on recommendations that we would forward to the council. Um, the recommendations, if if we don't get to them today, we will we will take them up next Thursday on the twenty second. Um, whenever they are taken up and whenever votes are made, um, either myself or Pam Rooney, the vice chair, will contact you after that time within like a day or so to let you know what those recommendations are as it relates to your application. Um, and it's just so you know. Um, Recommendations will be heard at the council meeting on June 26th um, is the plan. Um, appointments are aimed to start July 1. Um, at, 
if, if there are votes on the 26th to make appointments, you will hear from someone. I'm not sure who does that formally. It might be our clerk. It might be our president. I'm not exactly sure who does the formal notification um, that, that you have been appointed and for what term and everything. And then your term will begin July 1. Um, did I cover everything? I think I may have. Did I miss anything? It's been a long week. <laughs> Um, so, oh, Sarah, yeah, are there any questions? Sarah? Yeah, thank you. Um, because I, I won't be uh, staying in this meeting after you dismiss us. If you do not reach decisions today, could you just let us know that? So sure. we want to sure. attend next Thursday or whenever you continue. Um, sure. We'll, we'll be ready for that. Thank you. We will make sure one of us sends out a notice if we don't make recommendations today. Um, any other questions about the process going forward? Um, for um, well, yeah. So I think I think that's it. Unless there's any, Sarah, your hand is still up. Is that just lingering? Okay. Um, with that, then I'm going to ask our clerk to start moving our applicants into the attendee section. We will wait for that to happen before we begin our deliberations. Thank you all for all of your time. You're welcome to stay, or if you don't like hearing about us talk about you, you can leave <laughs> and watch it later. It's recorded. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. Manager, can I request a two minute break? Go take what? your two minutes while we're moving Thank everyone. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As people get back, please turn on your videos so that we know everyone has returned. We're missing just one person once Shalini is back. Um, we will start. I have a couple of update, uh, one update, I think it is basically, um, but we're waiting for Shalini. Shalini, when you return, please turn on your video. There we go. Okay, so as we move into this, um, you will have noticed that the um, that one part of our agenda talked about extensions of terms. I mentioned last week or the week before uh, one of our updates 
um, that we were waiting to figure out who the panel for the June 22nd um, CBA hearing that is going on that day um, is. I got that information yesterday. Pam was CC'd on that. Um, they, the, we're still being told that we, but it could potentially not go past the 22nd. So whatever we do with it might get pulled from the council agenda if it does not extend. But um, the panel includes three people that we need to consider um, in terms of extending. But um, our job might be made easier. One of them is Dylan Maxfield, um, who has not reapplied. So um, no matter what we do today, uh, we should potentially vote that extension. The other two panelists that um, have terms expiring are Sarah Marshall and David Slavater. Um, so depending on what we do today, which might make things easier, we might not have to extend their terms depending on our recommendation. Um, and I say things might may be easier because we can make a recommendation for no more than four associate members and two full members. Um, and so given the, our, depending on what we do with our applicant pool as being five for six slots and one, it might make it easier to deal with everything. So that's all I'm going to say. But um, so the names, the other two names that were on that list um, as potentials, um, Jordan Helzer and Vince O'Connor are not serving on that pool. So we don't have to, th those will not be considered for extensions. So I wanted to make that update um, before we get started into discussing the current candidate pool. As you know, we have two um, impending vacancies for three-year terms and four impending vacancies for one-year terms to talk about today. Our motion on sufficiency of the applicant pool in, included that we would definitely make recommendations as to the two three-year terms with the possibility of continuing and deciding to make recommendations on the one-year terms. Um, and as I did last Monday, I will go through some of the selection criteria just to remind everyone it's in a uh, packet, but um, the council selection tech criteria generally includes a good mix of new and returning members and a pool um, and a body that reflects the diversity of the town in a wide variety of areas. Um, the ZBA chair's selection criteria included a number of diversity uh, things along with a relevant background and understanding of the quasi-judicial nature of the ZBA and previous service on boards and committees. And I just summarized that very generally. <laughs> More specifics are, are in the packet. I was just trying to get out there, but quickly. So with that, um, I, I think it's still best, you know, I will go through the members. I'm, I, I, I'm going to leave it up to people to decide who they want to talk to instead of talk about necessarily instead of picking one and going through each one. Um, let each person decide what they'd like to say about each one. And then we can we can talk about what we're going to do. Um, so Pam. Thank you. Um, I am I am very pleased with the group of people that came forward to uh, offer their services on the ZBA. I'm I'm just I'm very comfortable with the range of skills we have we have backgrounds in law we also have um, some construction background even though it's not a primary um, capability necessarily but um, we have you know backgrounds in in zoning uh, lots of experience lots of experience on many boards uh, not necessarily in Amherst but uh, those skills serve wherever they incur are incurred, um, and I got a sense from from every single candidate that there is a a very strong emphasis on listening, and the impartial listening came through loud and clear in in everybody. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop there just because let other people talk and then I have some ideas about how I'd like to proceed. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, I feel like I was sitting there going, I'm trying to think the glass half empty or half full. The, the half empty is they're all so good, but we, you know, we have to make some decisions. The half full is that we do have five openings. Well, we have six openings for five applicants. So, but um, it's, so we can, you know, find a place for everybody, but it's really uh, a hard 
you know, it, they were just, it was a very strong applicant pool. Thank you. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Um, I, I will add my two cents since I don't see Pat or Shell in his hand. I, I agree with what Pam and Jennifer said. Yeah, that half glass, glass half empty and full. I was thinking the same thing as as all the answers were coming in, like, oh, this is going to be tough um, um, to figure out three year term recommendations and one year term recommendations. Um, yeah. And and basically what Pam said, right, um, we, we have, you know, some with zoning board of appeals experience some that have watched a lot but might not have served but also skills that um you know some with skills that our zba chair uh talked about potentially needing or wanting and, and part of the criteria and all so so i think we do have that that mix and and all of the i, I thought all of the answers and responses to the questions about waivers and differences and how you interpret bylaws and all of that were just fantastic um, in terms of how how this set of candidates would approach um, looking at the applications that are coming and and all of us know some of what's coming including some 40 Bs it's not you know it's it's not unknown that, that there's at least one 40 B potentially coming soon um, in terms of the North Amherst Ball Lane project because it's already sort of started part of that process um, and so yeah I think it's I I'm I'm not sure where I am yet but I'll let others talk about sort of the the pool itself and then maybe we can get into figuring out recommendations. Um, Pat or Shalini, would you like to add anything? Pat. Uh, I'm excited about this pool of people. Um, there's nobody I agree with 100% and there's nobody I disagree with 100% that I feel like each person is bringing something that um, leaves me thinking and, and think in terms of what the ZBA would be doing, how, how they would handle something like a, a large proposal, say like 132 Northampton Road, or um, so I, I'm excited. I don't think that we can lose with this group of people, whether they're experienced or newly approaching this work. Thanks, Pat. Shalini, do you have anything to add at this time? Nothing to add, just very impressed with the pool and grateful for the pool we have. Thank you. So if we've got nothing else to add, we'll talk about, you know, let, let's start maybe hearing some impressions of potential combinations as it were, because um, I think that's how we'll all be looking at it as, as potentially two, three-year uh, appointments and, and three one-year appointments. Um, and Pam, you said you had some. So Pam, if you'd like to go first, you can. <laughs> I'll put, I'll put the idea out there. Um, um, as we all said, I think I think there's some there are five great people that could step up and you know and climb learning curve learning curve quickly. Um, I I would be supportive of advancing the two current associate members who have done a good job, they've done their homework, they, um, they come to the table prepared, and uh, both have indicated that they're interested in, in the full um, membership that allows them to fully develop their on as a consistent member. Um, and that leaves three people who, uh, some of whom have not served in Amherst before, it gives them exposure. And perhaps the third person in that group um, who brings a wealth of experience um, to the table, but in fact has already had an opportunity to serve for five or six years, and that would be Hilda. Um, I that's that's my gut feeling is that the, the two current associates get um, get promoted, I guess, into full and the, the three um, associates, we could have three wonderful associates who would be ready to go, you know, at a moment's notice. 
So just my thoughts. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, I have my own, but I'm willing to defer to others if others would like to make thoughts. Um, I, I will put mine out there, which, which right now are still forming. Um, I, I think given what Pam said, there's definitely um, some support for going that direction. Um, but I, I go back to our selection criteria and, and that's where then I start struggling because, you know, given, you know, Pam, I, I would agree in some sense, that it's the most logical decision um, when what you, what you just mentioned. And this is why I start struggling because I go back to our selection criteria. And, and one of the things is reflecting the diversity of the town um, on many different levels. Um, but, but, you know, diversity of the town, geographic diversity, diversity, residency length, um, all sorts of things. And then um, I look at, and then I look at, you know, our chairs um, items that talked about um, the relevant background. Um, and our current membership that's continuing on, the three full members that are continuing on, all live in District 4. And then I start struggling because the two associates also live in District 4. And so if we go with the most logical where I start struggling is we would be appointing a board that all lives in the same district. And we have heard from our chair um, that, um, that geographic diversity can be very helpful on the ZBA. Um, and so I'm struggling with that part of it, given, especially given the fact that we see qualified other applicants that are just as qualified for various reasons to the two associate, uh, current associate members that are seeking to move up. Um, so, so that's one of my struggles. Um, and, and that's actually one of the more. And then, you know, I, I will say I, I was very impressed with Everald and Philip and Hilda and, and everyone. Um, but Everald's legal background on a committee that is quasi-judicial is, is one thing that I'm, I'm not sure any of the other current members have that legal background. I don't know all of them, um, but I don't think any of them have the legal background. And so when looking at um, other things in terms of trying to figure out what the right mix for this body is, what the where, when they are also qualified, what what we consider, you know, his legal background, I keep coming back to as, is this important? And, and is it important to, to, to have that as sort of one of the standard members? We know that um, associate members, as, as we heard both Sarah and um, David say today, are put on a lot of panels. Um, you know, and so I suspect that whichever way we go today, all five will serve on a number of panels. Um, but to think about which appointments we would have as sort of the default panelists, which is how I'm starting to think of as the full members, are the panelists we go to first. Um, that legal background just keeps coming back to me as saying, is that important enough to um, make a recommendation for a three-year term for him um, and to then provide some of that geographic diversity that, that um, the, the membership as a whole would not have if all we went with was um, the moving up the associate members in the, the way Pam said. So I don't know what the right answer is, but that's some of the things I'm thinking about in terms of where. Uh, Jennifer, well, then Shalani. Well, can oh, I just Matt. have a quick clarification? I'm sorry. Uh, can you tell me the districts of the other candidates? Um, so Everald is District 5, Philip is District 3, and Hilda is District 1. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, just for some clarification, at the moment, the two alternates live in different council districts. <clears throat> David's in District 3 and Sarah's in District 4. So just for you, 
our districts have already changed <laughs> and we voted in those districts. Yeah, but Sarah, they vote, they, they live in, diff they voted differently. They had different representatives on their ballot last time. I'm just saying they don't live next door. They actually do live geographic. I, mean, I just wanted to clarify that, no. that they're, you know, for whatever that, I'm not even putting, I'm just saying just for clarification, they don't live in the same neighborhood. And, you know, at the current time, they don't, I will say, I feel like they, I don't think Sarah considers me her council representative because I was, you know, <laughs> not on the ballot in her district. So yes, going forward, they will be, but they don't, they're not neighbors and they technically don't live in the same district now. I just want to throw that out there. They technically do because we've already had an election and a ballot voting on the new district. Okay, so to say they don't is, they both live in district four. Those are the districts, even so if do they have two four years council ago. Representatives? So I guess they have four council representatives. No, you, despite living in district four, represent council district three, even right, though you which is where one of the four. alternates lives. Yeah. So I'll just leave it at that. Shalini. Yeah, I was thinking of the same thing, which you said, Mandy, though not the residential side, but I think the less messy path seems what Pam just suggested. It's like cleaner. Um, it just seems easier to do that. However, um, especially bringing out the point that you did about res, I was just thinking of diversity in general also uh, to, you know, it, it becomes a little more awkward, like, but doesn't have to be. I think if we're all doing this to bring more diversity on our ZB, and I think everyone who applied today would also appreciate that. And I think we should move forward with a more awkward conversation of um, what, you know, who, and I think I would support your recommendation with um, uh, Avril, what's the name, sorry. Um, yeah, I I would support uh, his being a full. Thank you, Shalini. Pat? Yeah, I'm still um, trying to figure this out. Um, I feel um, Philip is bringing some real experience around uh, de land development, use, parks, uh, um, and much more experience I've got it written down that I, and it's I feel like it's a fresh voice. Um, Everall brings an incredible amount of information about the law and less experience yet around zoning. So for me, I see him, I really want him as an associate for a year and then to apply for a full membership. Uh, as a full member, not a full membership, a full member of or a permanent member, however we're defining it, uh, or a three year for a three year term after a year, I think that would be critical for him. Um, I really want to see him on the ZBA and I really, really, um, right now my top, top choices for the um, three year positions are Sarah Marshall and uh, Philip. Thank you, Pat. Everyone's quiet. So, uh, Pam. Um, just thinking about back to the criteria. Um, you know, if we're if we're looking to, I'll just say, if we're looking to sort of mix it up, um, one of the other criteria was experience, and and the chairs interest in, uh, I think he said, replacing current members who are just completing their first term with fresh members is counterproductive and impairs the work of the board. So he, he the chair, appreciates um, the some experience, at least some experience in going through the, the routines and the processes of, of what the CBA deals with. And if, and if folks are for some reason looking for regional distribution, I would say then that, that Hilda is the only other person that brings that um, 
experience in the zoning board and its applications and its processes um, to the to the front. Thank you, Pam. Shalini. Um, yeah, I would support um, Pat's recommendation then in terms of bringing diversity of voice and um, having, and he seems to have, like Philip has the, a lot, a lot of experience. Um, so yeah, I, I would definitely support that. Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really torn because I, you know, could live with, not live with, I mean, they're all really good candidates. It's just, it's, um, <laughs> so I, um, yeah, I, so if we were, I mean, I, I, so my instinct is to go with Pam's suggestion and maybe that's almost, you know, because it, it, it takes it having to accept or reject. I mean, it sort of makes it a process and it does, I think, make sense to me that, um, you know, they both, it, it seems like a logical progression to have alternates, you know, who serve in good stead if they want to move up to permanent to do that. So I'm totally comfortable with the two current um, alternates moving up to the two current positions. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, um, so I'm, I'm torn because I, I know I'm just flubbing around because there's, you know, I think they're all good. I, you know, I wouldn't want to be seen as rejecting anyone for the permanent positions. So, um, I also, um, you know, do agree with Mandy that I think, um, you know, the candidate who has the legal background, um, that, that, you know, made an impression for me as well. Um, so I, I don't know what, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I almost don't want to pick out two people aside from the logical step because and I do think that the associates, as you said, do um, they've been active? I think every associate has served, it, you know, for one application. Because if a full member, the way I understand it, is if they can't, an you know, there's an applicant, an application opens, and if a full-time member can't be at that meeting, and an associate sits in, then they follow that full application. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so the associates have, are active members yeah and and we currently have four and what sarah disclosed that she served on a whole bunch she was the only associate for about six months and then we we were able to appoint three others and david disclosed he has in that six months sat on three um i don't know whether that third counts the one he'll be sitting on on the 22nd or not um so that's either three or four um and the other two i do know have both served on at least one of them has served on at least one panel, if not more. Um, and I think the other one has too. Um, I mean, do we, it, would we vote on whether we wanted to go, you know, um, do the process of, of sort of advancing the two associates before getting to like that principle <laughs> before we get to individuals? So not necessarily because we have the council policy. Um, we do just make recommendations to the council um, and then- No, no, I just meant internally for us as no, maybe a way- to, um, No, we have to follow the council policy and that one has indications on reappointments that all, all are up and open um, and that the experience goes into the consideration as to, um, um, the consideration as to what to recommend. Um, and that's, that's, I, I don't know which number of the policy it is, but it's under reappointments of the policy. So that, that's the town council policy that's been adopted. Um, Shalini. So I'm again in complete agreement because everyone is so great here that I would 
have liked to have followed the natural progression that people who've already served other than the fact then that they're all in one district. And that is very worrisome to me, not being a member. I mean, even if I was a member, if they were all from my district, I would still be saying the same thing. I think we want people who, so that's the only reason. And then if you have to follow the order of progression, then Sarah, who's been there longer, can be, and then in the next round, we could have, um, you know. So it, it, I would like to propose Sarah's name forward. And then one other person who, um, who adds to the, continues to add to the diversity factor that we are looking for um, in terms of economic, age, employment, renter, homeowner, diversity. So if we look at all of these criteria, I think, um, in my opinion, both Philip, um, Philip and um, Everald would meet those criteria because they both bring different, they're newer, they bring a fresh perspective. Um, just, just what we heard, I think they would add more diversity. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so if we were going to you know, look at the new district, um, you know, if, if we were going to not, um, you know, progress the two alternates, um, I would be like Shalini, um, uh, you know, comfortable with any of the other uh, three. Um, I would, you know, like to, you know, I would vote for, for David. Um, as the alternate to advance to the um, full position. Um, I don't, you know, it's not, I think he's had, you know, a lot of experience. I think, you know, the fact that he, you know, he didn't, most of the alternates, you know, didn't get voted on. I wouldn't want to penalize him for having joined in December. Um, I, I really liked his, I mean, I liked all the responses, but the response that, you know, no one party, you know, necessarily should have precedence um, over another. I was um, a little uncomfortable with, as I was last time with um, Sarah's response to that, that the, the, the property owner should have precedence. I think, you know, as most of the respondents said, that that's, you, you, no one really has precedence over the other. You look at the whole situation. So that's just my opinion. Thank you, Jennifer. So I, um, I haven't said much since my first one, so I'm going to take an opportunity. I think Pat made a very good, um, argument for Philip um, and and you know Shalini has and I have 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 made um, some good arguments for Everald I could support either one of them um, I think if we were going to make a recommendation for either one of them for three-year terms, I would probably support Sarah over David for the other three-year term. Um, much more experience, much more experience than David, particularly with a wide range of um, um, applications. Uh, I was impressed when Sarah talked about in just a year, she's seen appeals from building commissioner decisions as well as many other things. Um, you know, I, 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 her response to the conflict question, particularly with her experience on the uh, CPA committee, um, and keeping the committee to discussing the issue at hand and not other issues related to the library construction or the library project, I thought was a very important answer and perspective and and how you approach decision making, particularly in a ZBA when you have to stick to the law and you're not supposed to consider anything else. And so that experience that she had with that um, is one of the things that would 
um, have me favoring her over um, David, although he has a lot of experience with conflict. Um, it's not as much in the um, municipal decision-making realm. Um, so that's where I would go. Um, I am going to have to switch my login to a different one as I have to start moving to do some child um, carpooling right now. So bear with me as I switch to a phone interface as we continue this conversation. I know Jennifer has to leave by two. Um, so hopefully it sounds like we might be getting a little closer, which is why I, I think we should continue the conversation as long as we can to see if we can get to a recommendation. Um, while I switch, I would ask Pam if you can take over facilitating. I know I put some draft motions in there. I won't have them in front of me um, for the continuing part of our meeting. Um, so um, the people can pull up draft motions for at least giving us language. If we get to that point, there would be I, language available. I can put them up on the screen too, if that's helpful, Pam, okay. just let me know. Oh, that would be great. I was just going to go look for them. So yeah, just, you. yeah, just let okay. me know when you're ready for them and I'll pull them up. Yeah, I'm not sure we're there yet, but I just thought yeah. I'm not going to have them on my screen. So I thought I'd tell others. So bear with me as I switch items and Pam, please thank you for taking over facilitating. Uh, Jennifer, oh, oh, she's. Yeah, I was just, um, you know, I, for whatever it's worth, um, I tune into a lot of ZBA meetings, and I know that even when I just wanted for people to know this in terms of, you know, um, whether whether an associate was paneled or or not for how many meetings ZBA meetings, that David as an associate, even if he wasn't. A, a voting member of the panel because he, but he sat in on almost every meeting. So when I would zoom in, I would see him, they still let him be a panelist, even if, so I could see he, he was there, even if he wasn't the alternate that was voting. And um, again, when I look back at my notes, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, Sarah and David are both immensely qualified and I think they've been terrific associates. And when they're you know, a voting member of the panel, you know, so I'm not disparaging anyone's participation or tenure. They've been both been terrific members. But I guess for me personally, when I look at my notes, you know, Sarah said, and we all have different opinions about this, you know, David said that no party has a greater interest, you know, the applicant or the, the abutters. And, you know, Sarah, what I wrote, jotted down is that she feels that the abutters shouldn't have a say over the property owner. And that's just, um, and, and I think if, if I have to decide, I would, I would vote for Sarah and David to both be advanced if we were gonna do that route. But if I had to choose one, um, I think it's on that, that approach that I would be, you know, that I would vote for David. Thank you. Shalini. So I just want to clarify what I heard of Sarah's answer because she didn't lead with, uh, I know you're focusing on that aspect, Jennifer, that she said it's a property owner. And that was like her last point that if nothing you know, worked out, I think she led with the idea. Her first point was collaboration can address concerns. And I think that's what I want to hear is neither. Because what, um, you know, what David definitely did say, no party has a greater significance except butters. So his leaning on the other side, except about a butters. Uh, so you can, you can take either of them and see as, you know, one leaning, both of them, I think, are talking about no party and talking about collaboration. And, and if there was a personal leaning that they have, you can see that they're on the other ends. So you can hold. And so, yeah, so you can hold. So I don't think we should hold one way or the other because I think both of them did not just focus on one narrow aspect. They talked about all parties and, and yet focusing a little bit more on one side or the other, so. Right. So that's why I don't wanna to have to choose between the two. <laughs> But if I do, I guess I would have to go that way. We all have to go one way. Right. 
Pat, any any thoughts? Many <laughs> and none. <laughs> I guess uh, the th thing that David said was no party has greater significance except the butters. And that is a critical statement to me, particularly from district three and four, because perhaps I'm scarred uh, by the precinct. <laughs> I'm scarred in the sense of my first experience on the council was 132 Northampton Road, which is now East Gables. And the abutters, and I was going to do this as a follow-up question to David, and then I didn't think it was necessary, but I guess I should have. The abutters were totally opposed to the pro project, totally, 100%. And one of the things that I watched is my idea of Amherst as progressive being destroyed by people who were saying, oh, we have to watch out for the young women at uh, um, uh, Amherst College. We, I don't want those people walking up my street as a shortcut to the bus stop. And, because, and for people who don't know who are listening, 132 North, Hampton Road was an affordable housing project uh, in Kurt, which 28, 25 or 28 studio apartments for people coming out of homelessness, addiction, people of low income, et cetera. So I listened. And if, if the abutters' voices were listened to the way, or given greater significance, that project wouldn't exist. Now, what happened, and this is important to me, is the we the town went we went forward we had public forums we had everything and i watched the re, the abutters change they started wearing i support affordable housing buttons even though they didn't in their neighborhood but they also offered some damn good ideas around um support um, having support on the property for the residents. So, and those, some of the conditions that they started to get to once they got rid of their, or they realized their assumptions were failing them, they, they made the project in many ways better. But I'm concerned when anyone says to me, they should have more significance. This is the way that I'm scarred because if that's true, this project would not have happened. It was a battle and it was, a, it was an intense battle. And it was a battle for the heart and soul of this community. Um, and it's gonna happen. And that's, that's really important. Uh, and I don't know where Sarah Marshall was or David was or Hilda was on, on that. I, I don't know. Uh, but I do know what the abutters were like and the intensity of their rejection of a project. Um, so that so so it makes me really uncomfortable to have four people from any if they were all from district two, I would not want four people because the zoning board has to um, represent, think about the common good, the community. And what might be uncomfortable for one district might be life-saving for another district or one area of our community or a different area of our community. Enough, I talk too much. Yeah, no, I don't mean yes. I don't mean yes, yes, you talk too much. I think, <laughs> Jennifer. Yeah, no, I agree that they, Usually when the abutters and the property owners and the ZBA work together, they come to a better project. Just for whatever it means, the 132 North Hampton Road, I don't think anybody who's applying had was involved in that at all because it was a totally different yeah. And I'm not order. saying they were. I, I know. Really yeah. Yeah, you know, I know. And, you know, because I always talk about um, the sunset-fearing townhouse development, which 
the community never objected to, but um, or the abutters never objected to, but just wanted some input, and they did. The developer was really amenable to it, so I agree. You always get a better, um, you know, when everyone's working together. I mean, I think we're I think we're nitpicking because everyone's they're very close, but I guess we can only vote for two people, so that's where. And you know, I don't. That's where we find ourselves. And I don't. I don't. Dis, I I know that the fact. I, I am taking into consideration. I just wanted to point out that they're in different districts now, but I understand that going forward, they'll be in one district and that that's a consideration. I, mean, I was just saying that I don't, they live far enough apart. I don't think they see themselves as neighbors, but I still get, get it. Um, we haven't heard from Mandy. We don't know if she is in her automobile traveling that she will, I guess, call in and Athena is listening for the call, I'm guessing, so she can patch her in. Um, it looks like she can, she's here and should be able to unmute, but I, I think she's driving, so it might be difficult. I, I wasn't sure if she was simply not going to be able to hear and speak or if she was, um, I mean, she's obviously not signed out. Do you have a Do you have a sense that she's going to um, try to to call in and be present? Mandy, if you can hear us, please unmute. Mandy, is this your like number me. calling ending in 8352? I think this is me. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you st you're still connected to figure the out other how to do it. So. Yeah, you're still connected the other I, way. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if I unconnected that way, if it would throw off my phone. So sorry about that. No um, worries. So I left that one connected, and when the meeting ends, it'll unconnect. <laughs> But I am here, I am listening, and if I don't have to use the phone to unmute, if I stay this way, um, I, I can participate. Okay, good. Well, I was, I was gonna add, um, you know, the, the conversation about um, the factors that keep coming back to my head are, um, for the full-time members that I'm feeling it would be appropriate to have the the actual experience um i know i know a lot of people get on the zba or on the planning board who in fact don't have prior experience so it's it's not that it's just that you know given the fact that we have people that have experience it seems to me um reasonable to to acknowledge that experience um i was i was also thinking a little bit about sarah's comment about um, the, the property owner having essentially the, the final word. And we, I think we have to remember that um, we're talking about special permits and we're talking about the fact that um, the only reason that it's a special permit is that it doesn't really fall within our rules. So it's, it's a discretionary opportunity for somebody who wants to make a change on on their property um, to be able to do so if you know if appropriate and so i'm i'm actually not sure that i would um support the fact that the that the property owner is uh has the priority as as uh, sarah ended up with her conversation with and I remember she said that last time as well. Um, and simply because it, it, no one is asking for a property owner to, um, to put forward something that doesn't follow the, the laws, doesn't, doesn't follow the current bylaws. It's, it's um, to me, it's, 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 it's not a given that they should that they should um, necessarily. I think most projects are great. Most projects are are sculpted in a way that 
that finally do meet a butter and an owner and town needs. Um, anyway, if I if I had to put someone forward, I think I I too would support David um, as a full member, and then look to someone um, from another district. Um, and if I had to pick, I would probably go with Hilda because of her vast experience and, and understanding of zoning. She's she's a wealth of knowledge. Um, that's where I would start. Jennifer. This is more just generally because I do, I, you know, again, I understand that, gee, I, I think we should look at it less, I'm just saying, as we go forward, maybe less district than geographically spread out, because like the new district five goes from Amherst Woods, it actually includes like it goes to downtown. So I'm just saying if, if we had it, if there were two applicants technically from district five, and one lived downtown, and one lived all the way in South Amherst, I don't, I'm just saying, I don't kind of going forward, that maybe we should talk about geographically and not in terms of council districts because they sometimes geographically don't make sense. That's all I want to say. Shalini or Pat, any? This is a collaborative process. Mm. Hilda does bring a wealth of experience. She also brings positions um, that are important to her. Uh, and I, I feel like I think there's a kind of rigidity there embedded in the experience. And I must admit, I'm concerned about that. Um, is she knowledgeable? Absolutely. Um, and I would, I would like to have her utilize that knowledge as an associate member, possibly as a way of allaying my concerns. You know, I, I, we're talking about people who work for a year and then are reappointed. And I would like to see whether my assumption is accurate or hopefully inaccurate in, in regard to Hilda, because um, I do value her experience. Um, I, I really feel like the two people I most want to see are Sarah and Philip. Um, and, I, and, and to counter the, the you, you know, 1954, uh, was when Hilda came to Amherst. And I'm afraid that there's less of, this is my assumption, and Hilda, I apologize uh, because I can be wrong, but I, I feel like there's an Amherst that she holds and, and, and wants. And then there's Philip who's coming in and I don't agree with everything he said which is, you know, I really didn't. Um, but I got intrigued about the different ways that I saw him thinking. Uh, pocket parks and seeing what the benefit is for families. You know, I, something I never thought of. Other things in terms of um, social justice issue and environmental issue. He's really the only candidate who spoke about uh, climate and mitigating climate. I mean, he didn't say that specifically, but when you're talking about pollinator gardens and everything. So I feel like he's bringing fresh energy and experience. And I, I remember from his say an encyclopedic memory of the zoning bylaws in, in Wilmington. That, well, I think that will help him to <laughs> review and understand and hold the quirkiness of our unclear and unsimple zoning bylaws. Um, and I, I, what I feel in there is a, a kind of layered compassion um, that I would like to see in public 
figures and people participating on committees. So I'm still holding to Sarah and Philip. Thank you. Shalini, you got your hand up. Yeah, I think I would add to the diversity factor that most of the people who run for council, not just council, okay, sorry, who join committees are retired older people. And here we have an opportunity to bring in younger people who are of a fresh perspective. And, and even though institutional knowledge and history is an asset, but as Pat pointed out, I think we need a balance of both. We need that as well as we need people who don't have as much history and are bringing fresh, like what is needed now in terms of building communities that uh, provide equity, social justice, that are looking at climate change, that is at the front and center. I know er most of his responses included some element of um, sustainability and or social justice and community. And so I would totally support Philip White in um, as a is bringing in that fresh perspective to our ZBA. And Sarah, as I've already said. Pam, Pam can I still be heard? Yes, you can be heard, sure. Okay, I, I thought I might still be able to. Is it okay if I, I make yeah. the comments now? Absolutely, yep. So I, I've been listening with with quite big interest and, and Shalini and Pat have been making a huge um, impression on me for Philip as an appointment, especially the climate action as I think about the zoning bylaw um, and how a lot of our bylaw requires a lot of unbuilt space and how that unbuilt space is landscaped. Um, I think Philip could bring a, a, a fresh, new, great perspective, especially with how he talked about the pocket parts and all of that. So. So I'm getting more and more excited about Philip as a three-year potential recommendation. Um, in listening to everything else, I, I'd still not, I, I, I would still, I think, favor Everald. And so I'm almost moving to potentially um, Everald and Philip as, as my, my leaning for three-year appointments. That legal background, I'm, I, I still think is necessary. And then when we talk about, we've heard you know, when we talk about a good mix of new versus um, returning, our three current members that will continue on um, have been there for a fairly long time. I think Steve Judge is near his sixth or maybe even seventh year um, as chair, and and um, Craig Meadows is is in his second term, um, and. Um, John Gilbert might be in his first term, but he has that, that architectural or engineering, I'm not sure which experience and background. Um, and so, you know, I think two individuals who have not lived in Amherst for very long and so bring um, that very long, I think Everald said five or six years or something <laughs> or seven years, that's still a decently long time, but compared to others, um, I think they would bring some wonderful experience, wonderful new perspectives um, to us. And, and I wonder if that is a recommendation that we could all get behind. It's sounding like um, there are potential concerns about both David and Sarah that, that make us as a body or in hesitant to, to go with one or the other. So, so I'm just putting that out there as maybe just the three-year terms, Everald and Philip, and everyone associates. Thank you. Any thoughts on Mandy's position? Pat. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Um, I could uh, support Mandy's suggestion of Everald and Philip. But Shalini. Yeah, I, I do like that third solution. <laughs> um, I just have a question for all of you who've been, you know, who are following CBA more 
carefully than I have if there is enough experience already. And I think what I did hear from Philip was that he has been you know, watching and with his experience in other cities that he probably is coming in with some amount of good experience, but how do people feel about the existing pool of experience? May I, pa Pam? Yep, yep. I couldn't hear the one last part that, of what you said. Um, so yes. one of the things I thought about when making this suggestion, Shalini was asking about the existing pool of experience. Um, if we if we go with this suggestion as a recommendation, Everald and Philip for three year terms, all of the associates will have some experience on the ZBA, whether it be a while ago or just recently as associates. And therefore, any associate needing to be used because someone can't attend is is, is someone with experience um, and, and a decent amount of experience or, or shallow experience, depending on, you know, six months or a year, you're just getting into it, right? Um, but if, if we swap and go with Pam's original suggestion and say um, the three other regular members could not be there and we ended up with a panel that we interviewed today, we would have very little experience on the board. Um, and so in some sense, I also like the possibility that the associates all have some experience because it would balance out nearly every panel. Um, between some experience and a little, you know, a, a great deal of experience and a little less experience. Thank you. If I can, if I can summarize that. So, because the if you if you went with your suggestion, and and the any panel that would be comprised that might need a an associate on it, you're saying because if. In your scenario, those three scenario, those three associates all have some experience that you would essentially keep the pool of experience in the associate team rather than rather than having them as full members just because um, a panel might be comprised of, I guess, too many inexperienced people on the primary membership? I, I guess not quite. So so here's what I'm thinking. If 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 we go with your suggest your original suggestion, Pam, um, of of recommending uh, David and Sarah for the three year term, they have a little experience, but not a lot, right? Less than a year. Um, and say our chair or Craig Meadows, some of our most experienced, had to not be on a panel, and the two people that were picked were Everald and Philip. We would have a very inexperienced panel for that panel. Um, that's a very possibility. Whereas um, with my potential compromise recommendation that I threw out there, if Everald and Philip are on the panel and Craig and Steve Judge can't be on it, the two people who would replace them on the panel would both have some experience. And so, you know, it it would still be a somewhat inexperienced board, but it, it might balance itself out because you could, all, you know, I, I don't know, I, I could be completely wrong in how I'm thinking about this, but that was one of my thoughts is that you would have a panel that has a good mix. You would be more likely to have a panel with a good mix of both experience and less experience with this suggestion, maybe. Others might think differently. Jennifer. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not really so much following the logic because of that because alternates aren't associates aren't always called so you're I don't know how many so is it Jordan Heltzer who we who's been on since December or January I don't know how many times he's been called to serve um 
I, I would feel uncomfortable. I mean, I, I could support Philip or Everald, but I would like to see one of the experienced, um, you know, one of the current alternates advance. And you, you know, I, I would be. Well, that's where I stand. I, I think that that I don't. I, I know that the ZBA chair really, you know, values that experience. Um, and I think, you know, Amherst is a complicated town. I think we definitely need new ways of, you know, we need fresh eyes, but also, um, you know, an understanding of the history. So it's, thank you. Um, it's two o'clock and I think we, um, are we, Jennifer, you were the one with the two o'clock deadline. Are you at all flexible? Um, it's not- I could go to 2.15, but then I, I have to stop, okay. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, and I, actually I do too. Thank you for reminding me. Um, um, so I'm I'm hearing more consensus for Philip that, that Philip is perhaps someone that um, brings a, a a good deal of experience on boards and committees, and um, in his in his approach to um, environment environmental concerns, that that perhaps as as one of the two full members, you know, is there anyone that wouldn't be able to support Philip? We can work sort of backwards. Can we can we raise our hands if we could support Philip? I could also support Everald. <laughs> Are you going to get to that? Yeah. Well, it's okay. Yeah. Um, and Andy, are you? Uh, she's calling in. No, I. I oops. There was a bunch of noise, so I muted Mandy. Mandy, you can push um, star six to unmute. Sorry about that. I thought it was just background noise. No, that was just me. I'm trying to transfer stuff. Can you hear me? Yes. So Mandy, the, okay. the, um, you heard the question? I did. I could support Everald. No, sorry, Philip for a three-year term. Right, that was the question. Yeah. Yes, I could do that. So that feels like a consensus, at least on one of the three positions. I mean, excuse me, one of the three-year positions. Um, the. the we have a we have a wild canary or something out there. I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, so I guess if we're, you know, when I said I could support both, so I'll just, you know, my hand would be, I think I, 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 I would like, I'm going to vote. David would be one of my selections. And I think, although, you know, that because um, Everald brings that attorney background and it it really seemed to you know inform um a lot of his responses those would be my you know that's where i would be going it, you know as much as you know i think hilda you know I, they're all terrific but you know for going through the list i guess if you were just going through the list and you said who could i support for full i would say everyone mm -hmm. but i can't vote for everyone so um but I would, I think if I had to pick between Everold and Philip, I would, and I was only picking one for the full term, I would um, probably lean towards Everold because he's an attorney. Okay. Pam or Mandy, would it make it easier to do these, to vote the two three-year terms separately in two separate motions rather than trying to pick a pair? Well, <laughs> it's the pair that matters, right? I mean, that's that's what it's boiling down to. Um, so if, um, 
we we all raised our hand for Philip White. And but I'm hearing Jennifer that if you could pick just one of the two that you would actually vote for Everald instead of Philip. Yeah, I, I mean, if I had to, but I, I'm not being very helpful. I'm just being <laughs> wishy-washy. It, no, it's how do you pick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know this is this is not. I think we need more. We need. Oh, <laughs> Athena is prompting us here. No um, pressure. No pressure. <laughs> I know we'll be here till tomorrow morning. <laughs> well. Can, uh, can I speak or? Yes, Pat, sorry, I was reading I, and not seeing hands. I, uh, I get tired of the Amherst culture wars, <laughs> you know, um, and I, I really feel like David and Sarah and Hilda bring baggage for that, that's of different size and, imp and baggage that impacts different people. And I would love to get two fresh voices, uh, knowing that I would have the backup of David and I'd have the backup of Sarah and the backup of Hilda's experience. So I really, really would like to see Philip and Everald uh, vote moved independently, you know, separately or together. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. Shalini. Oh, Mandy's, Mandy's. Okay, yeah, Shalini. Mandy. That, I was just going to say that's, so I was going to propose to move to propose David and Philip for these positions, full time positions. But Mandy, what did you want to say? Could, could you click? Who, who were you going to propose, Shalini? David and Philip. Not um, David, sorry. No, 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 I, I lied. Sorry. Let me get the names right. Uh, Everald and Philip, sorry. Oh my God, uh, that would have been a bit, bit of a problem. Okay, no. First time I ever initiated to move something, it was wrong. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Everald and Philip. Second. Uh, moved, yeah, thank you. So was that a motion being made? Yes. Okay, seconded um, by Pat. Mandy, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, no, I, I was, before Shalini made that motion, I was gonna support what Pat said um, mm -hmm. in, in nearly its entire entirety. It's one of the reasons I proposed um, David, uh, sorry, not David, Everald and Philip with three associates being David, Sarah, and Hilda. Oh, yeah. um, and I think and Shalini was your motion for Everald and Philip for so the recommend oh. the council appoint presidents Everald Henry and Philip White as members of the ZBA for terms effective July 1, 2023 and ending June 30, 2026. Yes. Okay, and, and I heard I heard Jennifer say that she could support Philip and Everald. Um, and if that is the if that is the leaning of the of the CRC, I am not opposed, obviously, to either of those candidates. I was hoping for more experience and a logical promotion of uh, and recognition of people's contribution that they deserve to move, you know, into into the the full role. I, I think, you know, if I were in anyone's shoes, I would certainly feel that way. So I I could support Everald and Philip um, at the expense I, I'm feeling of of some folks that have already contributed. So I I would um, you know I'll step off my block and and be happy to do this unanimously if that works. Is anybody going to talk me out of it? <laughs> Mandy's hand is up. Mandy, Mandy, your hand's still up. I don't know if that's... It is, because it shows that it's like 
but I, if I press it, oh, there you go. It would no, raise down. it. Oh, weird. Okay, sorry. Want to add anything? No, I'm just figuring out my Zoom on the phone, how to use it apparently. <laughs> Uh, sounds like if you want to take back the chairing, I don't know if that's possible, uh, Jennifer, and then and then maybe we go to a vote. Yeah, I was just picking up on a little what you said, Pam. I'm just, um, you know, wondering what message, it, you know, I almost feel like we're penalizing a bit those who have, have served um, and have some experience, you know, versus fresh eyes. So I just, you know, I, I, you know, I almost want to say to those associates that are willing to step, you know, step up for the three-year term, you know, I, um, cause I think that we're not, you know, um, just like I said, kind of, they're being a little penalized for their experience. Um, I just, that's, I just wanted to make that comment, you know, that, that it could be interpreted that way. Thank you. Shalini. I think how people interpret it, of course, they will have their own interpretations, but I think it's what we are bringing forward as uh, our intentions collectively as, um, as a committee is that, uh, you know, we have seen, and I think the people who've been here long enough also know that it's very hard to get different people from different neighborhoods, different age groups, and different, um, you know, personal backgrounds to participate in town government. And if that is the reason why we are proposing the two younger candidates or newer candidates, and if they can see that, I'm really sincerely hoping that our more experienced uh, applicants will recognize that, that yay, we have newer people who are willing to serve. And I think that if we can all hold that at the forefront while also acknowledging the years of service and institutional knowledge and respect that completely, and just hope that even though they're not gonna be in the full position that they will still continue to contribute uh, to the process. And I think it's a big win if we can get newer people with diverse backgrounds to participate and not um, uh, just. So that's where I think we can emphasize that as a narrative. Thanks. Uh, Jennifer, last comment. I think it sounds like- I just want to say, I agree with what Shalini said too. I, I don't disagree, I do agree. Okay. So I'm going to call for a vote then and um, we're going for, um, let's see. Okay, for the not more than two, uh, move to recommend the town council appoints residents Philip White and Everald Henry as members to the Zoning Board of Appeals to terms effective July 1, 2023, ending July 30, June 30, 2026. All those in favor, let's see, hold on, we gotta do this alphabetically. Um, uh, Shalini, please. Yes. Pat. Aye. Mandy. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. And Pam, aye. So that's unanimous, no absences. Uh, second one, motion for associate members. Um, it seems we're, uh, Mandy, you have your hand up. I was just gonna move on to the next motion. Okay, I was just reading it. Okay. Um, that the town council appoint residents, Hilda Greenbaum, David Sloviter, and Sarah Marshall as associate members to the Zoning Board of Appeals for terms effective July 1, 2023 and ending June 30, 2024. Um, let's mix it up. We'll start from the top. I'll Jennifer, second. 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 Yes. second. Okay, second. Thank you. Jennifer. Yes. Pam is a yes. Mandy. You're muted, Mandy. She's trying to figure it out. Your thumb up, you can no, put. Sorry, I the audio cut out for a while. Is it my turn? Yes. Yes. Aye. Um, Pat. 
Aye. And Shalini. Yes. And unanimous. Um, and we should vote on motions to extend term for members and associate okay. members not continuing. Is we that have correct? one more motion we need to make? Yes, the one at the bottom of the page. Yes, with just Dylan. Yeah. Uh, so it would read as as on the screen, it would just be Dylan Maxfield extension of term to complete hearing on which the members are serving. Second, DeAngelis. Uh, Shalini. Yes. Pat. Aye. Uh, Man uh, Mandy. Aye. Pam is an aye. Jennifer. Yes. Okay, that's unanimous as well. To extend, if needed, Dylan Maxfield's um, term to complete a, uh, a panel. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mandy, but I think the meeting is adjourned if you, um, unless you will, I will write up the note. So my audio keeps cutting. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write up the notes as um, you requested uh, the report to town council. We do not need to cover this topic on the 22nd and we'll discuss it or we'll present it at least on the, tw on the 26th to town council. Wow, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah, we did. And thanks right. to, to all the people watching and participants and- And all the applicants. I, yes. I, I, yeah, again, and please, I have no disrespect for David or Sarah or Hilda. Absolutely, Hilda. absolutely. And, and I wanna thank Pam for taking over for me. Oh, sure. yes, Good job. thank Good. you, Pam. Thank you. Uh, right, I'm gonna leave. Bye. Yep, it'll be a team. Bye, bye bye. Bye.